Hello. I'm very happy to be at this very important conference. My name is Darsha Narvaez, and I will share my screen now so you can see my PowerPoint and my name. So I am a professor emerita of psychology at the University of Notre Dame in the United States. The name of my talk is Education in a Time of Human-Caused Ecological Devastation. My question for this talk is, what is lifelong education for? What's its purpose? And these are the conclusions I will draw, that it is about holistic development of the body, mind, and spirit of each child. It is about ecological fittedness, the ability to live well where one exists on the earth, a know-how for living regeneratively on earth's landscapes, especially where you are. Ethical capacities, inclusive of all earth entities. So that means humans, animals, plants, mountains, waterways, the atmosphere, and so on. So this is lifelong education. We are currently not well. Humanity is not well, and it is spreading destruction everywhere it goes, and it's getting increasingly dire. In the United States, we have evidence for the decline of well-being. Uh, every day, new information comes out. And the reason to mention the United States is because the United States tends to export its ways to the world. And so the way the United States goes may be the way the world goes. So please pay attention and don't follow what the United States is doing. There in the United States, we have mental illness and violence, drug addiction and suicide increasing every year. Lifespan is shrinking. People under age 60 are at a health disadvantage compared to 16 other economically advanced nations. Child well-being ranks near the bottom of economically advanced nations. At the same time of this human devastation, humans are generally destroying their habitat, which means the earth, although this is not all human beings, but those who are following the dominant culture. And what's happening? Well, earth systems everywhere are breaking down. Climate instability, global warming, or climate disruption is uh, increasing. The ice caps are melting at the poles. There is massive ecological disruption from human activity virtually everywhere you look. There's a biological annihilation happening, meaning diversity of animals and plants are, are decreasing. Visible wildlife has decreased by 50% more than that in the last 40 years. There's massive poisoning of soil, air, water, our bodies. The oceans are filling with plastic and decreasing animal life. And at the same time, there is not much time left to reverse direction of humanity because climate instability is going to skyrocket it suddenly one of these days. So what are educators to do? That's the question then. Uh, I've mentioned the setting. What is education for? I will talk about six myths that guide education today and the dangers of schooling in general in regards to this bigger question. I will discuss holistic development across the lifespan and our ancient wellness promoting pathway, which contrasts with today's very dominant trauma-inducing pathway. Education's goal, um, I'm sorry, education's role, uh, I will also discuss in terms of nested classrooms, healing classrooms, uh, the classrooms that foster ecological wisdom and ethical development. 
And I'll conclude then by reiterating, by saying again, holistic education fosters the components of primal wisdom, which are ecological literacy, well-being, and inclusive ethics. Right now, the dominant world system is making us unwell and destroying biological and cultural diversity. Why is this? In part, because we forgot how to raise children to thrive and they become adults who are not uh, fully uh, reaching their potential. We also forgot how to raise children to be regenerative members of the earth community. And so in adulthood, they are not. And we forgot holistic ethical development and have narrow views of morality and ethics uh, that justify the destruction that's happening today. So the big question is, what is education for? David Orr has written about this for decades. He's an ecologist. And he says, without significant precautions, education, this means schooling, can equip people merely to be more effective vandals of the earth. And that means that cleverness is often fostered in schooling or education, but not wisdom. Another quote from Elie Wiesel, the Holocaust survival. He says, education is dangerous when it focuses on theories instead of values on concepts rather than human beings, on abstraction rather than consciousness or conscientiousness, answers instead of questions, ideology and efficiency rather than conscious. And in my experience, as I say here on the slide, my experience as a professor and classroom teacher for many years, I've noticed that too many disciplines, too much coursework, from kindergarten through uh, grade 12 to university and graduate school match this unfortunate description. David Orr discusses six myths that are guiding contemporary culture and education. Myth number one, ignorance is solvable, but this is not true. Ignorance is part of our human condition. Human, humanity cannot possibly comprehend the world in its entirety. Just recall that human beings only hear part of the audio spectrum, only see part of the light spectrum, and cannot see the dark matter that comprises most of the universe. So our senses are limited, our perceptions are limited, our knowledge is limited. Myth number two, humanity can gain enough knowledge and technology to manage the earth. Higher education often aims for this goal, but we're not doing very well. People cannot manage the planet's climate. We are experiencing global weirding, this climate disruption, based on human idealism and hubris, thinking that they can control it. The more realistic aim is to manage human desires, human economies, human communities, and human politics. This involves shaping our desires and actions to fit our finite planet. This involves ethics. Myth number three, human knowledge is increasing and as part of this, humans are getting better. Well, <laughs> It's true that some kinds of knowledge are increasing, but most research in universities does not provide measurable benefit to anybody or anything. It just keeps us busy. In fact, data are often confused with knowledge. Cleverness is often confused with intelligence. And cleverness here means a focus on short-term methods and goals. Intelligence is and aiming towards wholeness over the long term. These are ancient values. Our ancestors had these values of concern for the seventh generation. Somehow we are only concerned for the next quarter in this 
uh, dominant culture. At the same time, many kinds of knowledge are decreasing. For example, the most important perhaps, ecological knowledge. It's on a decline in, in economically wealthy countries. Whereas in our past, and we've been here for 2 million years, in our past, indigenous place-based knowledge that all our ancestors had kept them surviving and thriving, but is now being lost through colonization and globalization. Myth number four, humanity can restore what it dismantled. It's hoped uh, that when you separate subjects in a curriculum, that the students will put it back together into some whole picture, but this rarely occurs. The well-educated people operate in their specialties without attending to the unity of things or to the consequences for the planet and for human personhood. Specialization is dangerous in this way because the big picture is lost. As a result, the educated have largely led humanity to massively poison air water and soil, destroy biocultural diversity, and destabilize planetary ecosystems and the climate. But at the same time, because of this incomplete education where ecology is ignored, for example, humanity is led to believe that we are much richer and better off than we are. Myth number five, the purpose of education is monetary success, upward mobility. But Orr points out that the planet does not need more successful people, but it does desperately need more peacemakers, healers, restorers, storytellers, and lovers of every kind. It needs people who know how to live well in their places on earth. It needs people of moral courage, willing to fight the fight to make the world habitable and more human in terms of our ancient knowledge of being human. These qualities have little to do with success as the dominant culture has defined it. Myth number six, the dominant culture is the pinnacle of human achievement. Well, not if you look at the data, not if you know our deep history. Today, capitalism is destroying morality by making everything about money and efficiency, wiping out the planet's biodiversity, cultural diversity, and moralities of kindness and compassion. Educated people have done this, have brought us to the sixth mass extinction on the planet. <clears throat> so these myths are dangerous and they're operating today and we need to do something different if we're going to survive as a species, if we're going to help the planet Earth maintain any sort of biodiversity. <clears throat> Instead, we have the dangers of today's mindless schooling. Schooling is dangerous when the rest of a child's experience lacks intimate friendships and lacks deep relationships with the natural world. And Orr points out three dangers. A rushed adulthood. This is where young people find a career before they find a calling a calling that will bridle and channel their ambition. They will focus then instead on making a living before discovering who they are, what their gifts are, and how best to use them for the benefit of the community of life. At the same time, they can be easily manipulated by bad actors, people who are discon disconnected, unconcerned about the well-being of all. So if you send students to Wall Street, to financial uh, firms, 
right after the university, they are susceptible to actually perpetuating the damaging uh, actions that are occurring in the dominant culture. In contrast, in traditional societies, education focuses on finding and honing the individual's gifts for the benefit of the community. This is where we need to return. The second danger is fragmentation, that schooling and its curricula offer a fragmented, disconnected view of the world. The graduates do not feel connected to their place on the earth. They do not feel connected to nature. They may not feel connected to the community. Instead, they can become morally sterile, disconnected technicians, cleverness instead of intelligence, cleverness instead of wisdom. Danger number three, a loss of wonder or tells us that schooling can damage the sense of wonder, the sheer joy in the created world. How does this happen? Schooling reduces learning to routines and memorization. Abstractions are divorced from lived experience. The curriculum is boring. Students are humiliated. There are too many rules. Grades are overstressed. Too much time is spent on screens and too much spent inside or walls, indoors. All these factors deaden the feelings from which wonder grows and natural learning uh, in includes the sense of wonder when you learn automatically as a child uh, what interests you. Wonder is based in a trust of the world as a largely friendly place where one can feel and be. Wonder, though, is fragile and easily crushed. Then it's replaced by cynicism. <clears throat> Our ancestors knew better. They knew how to cultivate holistic development, how to live regeneratively on Earth's landscapes, and how to grow and live on inclusive ethics. My recent books here with colleagues um, discuss these elements uh, of our ancestral wisdom. So let's discuss though holistic development. It begins before children start school. <clears throat> the pathway towards flourishing is established in early life. Humanity's wellness promoting pathway includes these elements. Young children's needs, their basic needs are met. Uh, this promotes health and thriving in the child as they grow and mature. They develop a heart-minded individuality and community. And then they have a know-how for regenerative, compassionate lifestyles. So let's look at those very quickly, those four pieces. What are our basic needs? Well, we are animals and we need nourishment, warmth, protection and safety, and a sense of competence of feeling at home where we are on the earth. We also are mammals though, and we need lots of affection and play and feeling included in the group, in the family. We're also social mammals, so we need extensive bonding, community support, and ongoing social enjoyment. This is important for our mental and physical health. We're also humans with specific needs, such as intersubjectivity, that mind and heart and emotion sharing with multiple adults as we grow up and with multiple friends or companions as we mature. We need to be immersed in communal life, uh, not isolated. We need apprenticeship in adult activities as we grow up. Uh, we need mentors throughout life. We need to make meaning out of our lives. We need stories and narratives that tell us why we're here, why we're important, what our purpose is. 
And we need opportunities for self-expansion and healing that go beyond the present moment or our, our imbalances and our illness and get us back into uh, harmony with uh, each other and the world. Well, how do we meet? How do we meet those basic needs? Well, we have a nest. We have, uh, like all animals, have a nest that promotes our well-being. Uh, we have species typical developmental system and that supports those basic needs. And we have uh, a smart outcome, a smart effective teacher becomes uh, our, our outcome. How is it then we meet those needs? What's that nest look like? We call it the evolved nest. And for young children, it includes soothing uh, perinatal experiences. That means during pregnancy and birth and after birth, they're very soothing and calming and connecting. And then on request breastfeeding for several years, human milk. And then all the rest of these components are for all of us throughout our lives. And that means positive touch, lots of moving touch, rocking and dancing and such, no negative touch, positive welcoming climate. So we always feel like we belong and we matter. Self-directed social play. So we build our social skills and our ability to control any aggressive urges and learn flexibility with others. Allo mothers or allo parents, other caregivers uh, or mentors throughout life. Responsive relationships, meaning our ability to uh, feel like our needs can be met. In babyhood, that means uh, people who keep us calm while we're growing so quickly. Nature, immersion, and connection so that we feel placeful on the earth. And healing practices routinely so that we get back into balance. All these things we study in my lab, these are wellness-informed, part of that wellness-informed pathway. These are a set of social and ecological circumstances that are typically inherited by members of a given species. <clears throat> they are one of many inheritances beyond genes. They're mostly over 75 million years old. In effect, evolution has done the experiments on these things. We need them. And neuroscience now confirms they're important for our well-being. And they're really the original instructions for raising a human being, provisioned by a community. Human babies, in fact, resemble fetuses of other animals until about 18 months of age, with rapid growth underway, thousands of synapses, that means brain connections every second, so their needs should be met quickly to foster a well-functioning brain. In fact, brain, body, mind development is so quickly there's a constant interaction between nature and nurture that means you can't separate them there are epigenetic effects of early experience for all systems that means genes are being turned on and off depending on experience and we are developmentally plastic as dynamic systems uh, initial um, conditions are particularly important for a dynamic system uh, so we want to start things off well because it affects the tra trajectory of the future. And we are biosocial creatures. Our biology is constructed by our social experience and our social capacities are affected by and rooted in our biology as we grow and mature. So really, caregivers are co-constructing our emotions and cognitions together and our sense of self our social self, our moral self, and our view of the social world. So babies really need a womb with a view, uh, an exterior gestation that provides that evolved nest uh, that I mentioned. To become human then, you need to feel like you are uh, wanted, that you are safe, that you are welcome. Gene Meadloff has a quote here that's very helpful. 
The feeling appropriate to an infant in arms is his feeling of rightness or essential goodness, the premise that he is right, good, and welcome. Without that conviction, a human being of any age is crippled by a lack of confidence, a full sense of self, of spontaneity, of grace. Now, you may all know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You can see it on the left side there, on this hierarchy. He was inspired by the Blackfoot uh, Nation in the United States, now what is now the United States. And they actually have a different view. He kind of turned it upside down that the most important thing is to help the individual self-actualize, which helps the community actualize, which then supports cultural perpetuity. So it's ongoing survival and thriving across time for that community rather than the individualism that you can see in Maslow's hierarchy. What does that human thriving look like then? Well, <clears throat> this is the wellness pathway. When you provide the evolved nests, we see people with quiet minds, uh, inner happiness, a vitality of being fully alive, fully autonomous, making their own decisions and choices, fully honest, with a great sense of humor, <clears throat> outstanding memory and senses, the ability to build habits at will, a know-how for getting along in a particular landscape where they live, and with a deep ecological attachment and relational respect for the natural world, a connection to spirit <clears throat> with awareness beyond the manifest, and in relationship, they enjoy being with others, enhance their well-being, relationally attuning and responding to others, providing empathy and unconditional listening, having a communal orientation. They are authentically helpful. They provide unconditional love and forgiveness, generosity, sharing, practiced and expected. They're egalitarian. <clears throat> they don't coerce anyone else and they respect ancestors and future generations. They feel a responsibility towards the web of life. Then in fact, they grow an empathic engagement uh, kind of personality from their experience of it. They experience presence and reverence and synchrony. They feel empathy, empathic uh, support and perspective taking and this intersubjectivity and perspective taking and small I ego, <clears throat> which then builds an ethic of love, sympathetic action, and egalitarian respect. The third aspect of the wellness informed pathway is heart centeredness. These are ethical mindsets that are peaceable. So in face-to-face -face relationships, you're able to be flexibly relationally attuned to the other and you feel fully present in the moment, cognitively, emotionally, uh, physically. You resonate with the other and, and treat them with egalitarian regard in an I-thou kind of relationship instead of treating them like an it, an object. You have a small ego and you enhance the other person with your comments, your presence. And all this, these are developed by that early supportive system of the evolved nest. And then when the abstracting capabilities come in with maturity, your imagination of thinking outside of the present moment is based in this attunement to this relational engagement orientation. And so you apply it in your imaginative work, you're abstracting a sense of egalitarian respect for those you do not see, a sense of resonant responsibility for them and sympathetic action you take, and you have a sense of personal agency and your sense of communion with others that flow together. And this is fully expressed in compassionate action. These are all constructed after birth. We look at what societies look like when they're made up of people who have been nested. They are egalitarian. They feel connected to a sacred web of life. They focus on harmony and balance. They have high autonomy, 
but also high communalism. And they spend a lot of time in this inclusive social engagement with shared music, dance, and song, and laughter, and no coercion. Their higher consciousness is inclusive, and they're emotionally engaged. And they have very little time they spend in social self-protection. Finally, Wellness 4, that Earth-centered living know-how, this is what develops when you've been nested and with all the components I've mentioned, you feel that every creature is part of an interacting dynamic whole. All are relatives deserving of respect. And Aldo Leopold um, has this quote, which I think is very appropriate for understanding how action is taken. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. So this is an environmental ethic. So the path to wellness is part of our heritage. It's part of a cycle of what I call a cycle of cooperative companionship, where nested companionship care is provided from conception through the evolved nest. This builds healthy psychosocial neurobiology in the child and adolescent and adult. And the adults uh, grow into well-being and compassionate wisdom. And they create communities that continue to attend to basic needs and respectful relations. <clears throat> so what happens, however, when you move from societies who treat their young like this, lots of caring, touch, attention, responsiveness, to societies that treat their young like this, lots of isolation, inattention, and uh, control? Well, you've now shifted You've created a species atypical developmental system. So it's not going to be a surprise that you're going to have a species atypical outcome. It's going to be outside the evolved range of intelligence and effectiveness for that species. That's us. So what we've done now, we forgot the wellness promoting pathway, and we are now on a trauma inducing pathway that's developed over the last millennia, especially the last few hundred years especially in the 20th century, where we undercare for children, for babies. We don't meet their basic needs. We minimize them. We have more important things to do, like working and making money, right? And so you end up with a person that's wounded and has ill being, and all sorts of systems are dysregulated. <clears throat> you underdevelop their humanity because they don't reach their full potential in any way. And they have a lack of know-how for re uh, living a connected, regenerative life. And so they're unnested, which I call under care. And what happens is you end up with a person who has dysregulation in different systems, the stress response system, the immune system, the oxytocin system, many systems, depending on when the stress was experienced. This is going to then seed Ill, Ill, Ill health. Uh, that means mental health will be worse. Anxiety, depression, anger, reactivity, physical health will be worse, social health, and moral health. There'll be a general disconnection from the self, from others, from the community and the world. What kind of physiology does this early undercare promote? Well, you can see the image here of a three-year-old, two, three-year-old ch children's brains um, sliced uh, so you can see how big they are. A normal three-year-old child's brain on the left, a neglected, extremely neglected child's brain on the right, so they just don't grow as well. So there's a growth issue. And then all sorts of systems just don't get set up properly. And there can be gaps or lesions in brain systems that won't show up until adolescence. And then all of a sudden you have a depressed or anxious adolescent if they weren't already as a child. The emotional circuitry, circuitry is established in early life and forms the brain's architecture for sociality, morality, and ethics. So when the brain doesn't function well or, or moves into a stress response, you just cannot be open-minded and open-hearted. <clears throat> and think very well because the blood flow is shifted away from those systems. 
And what we find then here is uh, that there's a power of undercare in the brain. We're born with these survival systems that have these built-in mammalian emotion systems of anger, fear, panic, and basic lust. And these are integrated with a stress response, fight, flight, freeze, faint. And with good development, uh, the, well, let me just first say, then we grow the mammalian aspects, these emotional systems of care and play after birth. And we grow our executive functions and our higher order thinking after birth as well. And these interact with the other systems. And when a brain is grown well, nested well, these systems can control the survival systems. So if all of a sudden you feel afraid because there's a shadow that came and made you think of a bear coming after you, but really there's no bear, this these systems can immediately calm you down. <clears throat> and a good brain, then a healthy brain, spends most of its time here in a sense of community, social connection, heart-centered imagination, um, being with others. A poorly functioning brain, however, uh, in early life, this toxic stress of early life will lead to uh, a promotion of the survival systems. And when the stress reactivity uh, is triggered, it will control the executive systems and you will not be able to calm down. You'll be just panic, 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 for example, or angry, angry, angry. And in early life, if you're not nested, these systems will not grow properly. And so you end up with a very hampered, impaired brain function. And what happens in each situation, <clears throat> you come to a situation and you feel safety or threat. Just automatically, very quickly, you move to one side or the other. Uh, and so if you feel unsafe and people who are unnested uh, will automatically spend more time over here on the right side, they'll move into fight or flight or freeze or faint and hide, they brace against life, they're in defensive mode a lot. Uh, the people who are well-nested and feel safe, and when you feel safe, you're gonna be over here, you'll feel like you can approach the others and feel safe with in relationships, even with strangers, you'll read them uh, very well and you're open to life. So the one uh, on the right, is really trauma and foreign practices that are coming into many institutions and schools in the United States are aware of these triggers, these ways people can move into this defense. But what also needs to happen is a wellness and foreign practices that promotes this side. And that's what the Evolved Nest is trying to point out, the importance of promoting this and not just preventing that uh, reaction. And then top down shifting also happens, the conceptual framing. If someone has told us over and over that green people are scary and dangerous, when we see a green person, we will suddenly shift over into the unsafe mode. So it can happen top down from the stories we're told as well. Or, uh, yeah, I'll go on. So our protectionist mindsets from undercare and the face to face versions here our social opposition, we go into the fight mode and I'm going to be dominant in this moment, or we go into the withdrawal mode and oh, I have to hide myself. I can't be myself because that person will hurt me. Or we dissociate because the person reminds us of someone who bullied us and we just freeze out and disappear. So these are systems that are innate to protect us, but when early stress is, is toxic, it's they. Uh, these systems, systems are enhanced and they will dominate our social experience. And then our imagination will be moved into these protectionist mindsets because our brain is so focused on threat and feeling unsafe, we will want control. We will want to control others and we'll use vicious imagination to do that, that we have the underlying need for control or feel resentful and angry, and will scapegoat others or impose our idea of what's good on them and so on. Or we will disappear into the intellect, detached imagination where we don't really feel close to anybody, will be emotionally cool or cold, be using our left brain's capacity for categorizing and stereotyping other people, objectifying, dissecting, ordering them, 
decontextualizing everything, seeking control, uh, and firm answers, certain answers, calculating utility or usefulness of other people and things, and we will innovate without a sense of consequence. This is all left brain dominance, and in part because the right brain has been underdeveloped. This is our world today. Uh, these are what we are educating for. And this is what happens then we, when uh, students come to school, <clears throat> they arrive partially or underdeveloped. They're very needy and they need uh, more nurturing than they have received. And what happens, as I mentioned, the right hemisphere <clears throat> in particular is underdeveloped without the evolved nest. And that includes uh, also the prefrontal cortex, as I mentioned, that's a controlling executive functions. And what's underdeveloped then is self-regulation of various kinds of aggression, of um, impulse control, and our ability to get social pleasure is underdeveloped, our emotional intelligence, empathy can be underdeveloped, our sense of being in our bodies, being present, our ability to transcend our ego, our ability to have a sense of higher consciousness, uh, a unity with the cosmos, and our receptive intelligence, our ability to pay attention and receive the communications from other people and from the natural world. So <clears throat> what's education role? education's role here? Nested classrooms. How do we repair that early life stress? <clears throat> Excuse me. We have at evolvenest.org, uh, we have a child care checklist for child care centers for preschool and what to look for uh, for nesting conditions for that age of child. I also have this in general for nested classrooms. Generally, you want to have a welcoming classroom culture uh, with developmental discipline. So that means to help the child learn to self-control and uh, to realize their effects on others. There are stories and activities that encourage social and emotional learning, and there are stress reduction activities that are built in. There's a great amount of time spent in play, free play, and their pre-planned activities are kept to a minimum, especially for the younger children. Uh, and then touch and movement are uh, uh, plentiful, and based on what the uh, school culture, the uh, community culture, and the child prefers, their cuddles and comfort are given when needed. Music, uh, the ability to sing, make, and move to music is uh, widespread. Children also have opportunities to create art freely, not uh, restricted in particular <laughs> patterns. There's group cohesion. Children of different ages socialize together, so not just the same age, because that actually promotes risk-taking and competition rather than cooperation. There's nature immersion and connection. So that means experiences of nature outside with na natural creatures is taking place most of the time or many times during the day. <laughs> this allows students to build attachment to nature, and they learn how to respect the natural systems of their neighborhood. There's a sense of placefulness. Children routinely meet with local community members and visit places in the community and understand then how to help them flourish. <clears throat> Nutrition uh, is non-processed food. Children are allowed to eat when they need to. Caregivers make sure that healthy food is available. And community engagement. Members of the community mentor the students' work Elders are available for cultural sharing and guidance. So this is a sampling of what a nested classroom looks like uh, across ages. How about classrooms that support healing? Because we have a lot of wounded children. This is particularly true in the United States where we don't care for young children or families very well. And so there's a lot of um, disruption in development. Well, I told you that we have these self-protectionist systems that are built in that get enhanced by um, undercare and social capacities are underdeveloped and so are the imaginative executive functions. So what we do, what I've done with my students 
is we learn many self-calming techniques so that in the child or student learns to recognize when they're starting to feel afraid or angry and then can uh, trigger their self-calming patterns. We also, uh, because so many young people spend so much time in front of a screen or with a phone uh, texting or um, just not face-to-face -face with people, they um, need to learn to be face-to-face -face and experience the joy of that and get back in their bodies uh, interacting. And so we do various activities that do this. And I was a music teacher, so we would play folk song games in my classroom of college students, and they would learn then to enjoy uh, laughing and singing together and moving and playing, uh, and that's building the right brain. So the right brain grows when you have to be present in the moment with others, because you have to learn how to be flexible. You have to tune in, or people will stop playing with you, right? Uh, so that's growing the right hemisphere's capacities. And then you also want to build a communal imagination, not an imagination about how much money can I make in the job I'm going to get, but how am I going to, how is my work, how is my lifestyle going to enhance the well-being of everyone else, right, or my local community? So we need to rebuild human capacities, for example, then in, in this survival-rooted dysregulation, we want to belly, belly breathe, meditate or visualize, use ceremonies that could help calm us down, have class meetings where people can express themselves and feel safe. We want to develop that right hemisphere through play, communal activities that promote a joy and social pleasure. Art and music creation are particularly good here. And then we want to promote that communal imagination with asking questions like, how does our class support the well-being of our community? of the world, of nature. How is this information we're learning in class, these skills we're learning in class do these things? So healthy development begins and is sustained by the evolved nest throughout life. We have at evolved nest, 28 days of self-calming, which you can use uh, just to learn for self-calming for those people who need uh, um, nudges. We also have 28 days of nature connection based in an experiment I did with college students that um, where you take one different activity and do it throughout the day just to get back in your body, get back in the present moment and feel related to the natural world around you. All right, then let's look at the classroom that supports ecological wisdom. Or uh, David Orr uh, has six principles for ecological literacy. Principle one, all education is environmental education. So every student should realize that he or she has a membership and responsibilities in various ecological systems. So every aspect of the curriculum should address the laws of ecology and interdependence, including sustainability and environmental ethics. So in every class, we need to make sure we're understanding and applying the information or the learning to our environmental living. Principle two, the goal of education is the mastery of oneself. Subject matter really is only a tool to reach this mastery. Overall, students should learn the art of living well in place. What does it mean to live well in this community next to the river or with next to the forest? How do we maintain the well-being of the natural entities around us? Principle three, to know something means to understand its effects on people and communities. Or says we are still educating the young as if there were no planetary emergency. And he said this in 1994, and it's so much worse today. We are still educating the young as if there were no planetary emergency. Oh my goodness. So we, we have ideologies of the bottom line or efficiencies that have entered and destroyed many communities across the world, undermining biodiversity and creating all the problems or many of those that I mentioned earlier. 
So each student should know how what they're learning affects people and communities. And that means the environment as well. Principle four, knowledge is accompanied by the responsibility to use it well. The aims of education then should be how to maintain stable and healthy families and communities, how to facilitate decent work that limits harm to life, how to enable a lifestyle that to the extent possible restores what has been damaged in ecosystems. <laughs> Principle five, educators, administrators, and their institutions are role models of integrity, care, and responsibility towards nature's systems. True intelligence is integrated, not clever and quick, because it takes time to think holistically with moral imagination. It takes time to understand empathically the perspective of everyone and everything possibly affected by one's decisions. Principle six, learning is active, not passive, as with lectures alone. Children need firsthand knowledge of connecting mind, skill, and living holistically with a full range of human capacities. This fosters resilience for living in any circumstances. Finally, principle seven, nature connection is a critical need. Nature connection or biophilia is the love of all living things. It's best built first in childhood and young childhood, but parents, communities, and educators can provide the free roaming, immersion, observational, and practical experiences that help the child weave him or herself into the landscape. Now I want to focus on the work that I've done with my colleagues on ethical development. What do classrooms that support ethical development look like? And this, this information is based in the Minnesota Community Voices and Character Education Project. How do children grow into moral adults? Well, we have a RAVES model. So it starts with relationships, apprenticeship, virtuous village and models, ethical skills, <clears throat> self-authorship, and self-actualization. First, teachers should have a caring, responsive relationship with each child. This engages the emotions, and which are fundamental to learning. <clears throat> this relationship then will foster a secure attachment, which builds a bridge for instruction, secures the child's attention, establishes a line of influence. Now, these are especially important for minority, uh, well, actually for United States um, children in general. Uh, <clears throat> these are gonna build a physiological orientation towards relational attunement allowing the stress hormones to decrease and the affiliative hormones to increase like oxytocin. And this relationship building may take longer with some students who have built a general sense of distrust towards adults. As part of this relationship focus, you want to have a supportive relational social climate in the classroom where the whole community feels welcomed. The community welcomes each person and the community meets the basic needs for responsive relationships, for affection, for play, belonging, autonomy, trust, self-enhancement, and meaning making. <clears throat> we have research on the importance of all these for uh, student learning. This welcoming community then also fosters nature, nature immersion and connection so that the community is always larger than the classroom, larger than the school. The community also has conflict resolution strategies to help students get rebalanced and harmonious in their relationships. And it encourages pro-social imagination and their unique human potential. 
our human heritage is to have community support, uh, positive community support through social play and many uh, social events and festivals. And in these um, experiences in our ancestral context, they are daily, but uh, <clears throat> more recently they're, they're periodic. They include singing and dancing, laughing and teasing, telling jokes and stories, relaxing and sitting close. All of these things affect the physiological systems that build social connection. Second for raves is apprenticeship. You can see the A, apprenticeship. That's how we learn naturally. What does that look like? Well, there's an expert who models behavior, who thinks aloud, who coaches the student, explains the reasoning or meaning at the same time as authentic experience. And then the student is practicing, immersed in the um, action. They're focused on skill development and they have extensive practice. In our project, we had a novice to expert learning approach that we built into our teacher educator materials. The apprenticeship pedagogy then has four levels that we uh, set up. One was level one, immerse the student who, who's totally ignorant, immerse them in examples and opportunities of the particular focus. <clears throat> you, the child is uh, encouraged to attend to the big picture and to learn to recognize basic patterns. And this, you can see when you learn to swim, for example, your parents or family took you to the swimming pool or the lake or the ocean, the beach, and you saw people interacting with water. And that's the big picture. You know, they're moving, they're swimming, but you didn't know what that was really. Level two <clears throat> is you start to draw the student's attention to facts and skills, particular ones for that particular domain, focusing on detail, prototypical prototypical examples in order to build knowledge. So you as a, a child at the beach or the swim, swimming pool <clears throat> will notice, look, they're kicking their legs. Uh, gee, I could kick my legs too. Oh, well, look, they're moving their arms. I can move my arms too in the water. Level three is to practice procedures. So to set goals and plan steps of problem solving and practice the skills together, you at the swimming pool would then put your legs and arms together and swim across the pool. You're uh, practicing holistically. And level four is to integrate knowledge and procedures across contexts so that you can swim anywhere. You can swim in the lake or in the swimming pool. And level four then is about <clears throat> executing plans and solving problems in a, in a larger way in multiple contexts. And I'll talk shortly about the ethical skills where we laid out multiple skills in these uh, novice expert learning levels. <clears throat> then we have the V for virtue, virtuous role models and uh, virtuous elders who offer support and stories. So the elders come in from the, <clears throat> the village, the local community, and they offer stories about their genero their experiences of generosity, respect, connection, all the virtues, kindness, compassion, forgiveness, humility, courage, honesty, so that the children are, their meaning making is oriented to what's valuable for the community. And they see how it's fleshed out, what is concrete about it, how to be that way. And then the, the classroom also focuses on global citizenship. How do we make the world a better place with the skills we are learning. The village offers multiple mentorship and the students get to imitate the elders or the uh, experts. And there's opportunities to practice, 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 which is how you build expertise. So these elder stories provide a community history, uh, a hope and guidance for the young. Adults can come together with the stories about their own development and share their journeys. And they understand that their own characters are under construction by the activities they pursue and by how they use their imaginations.
So let's go more deeply into expertise. Generally, how are experts different from novices? Well, they have more and better organized knowledge. They have procedural and conditional knowledge, which means they know what knowledge to access, which procedures to apply, and how to apply them, and when, and how much, right? They perceive the world differently. They see underlying patterns that novices do not see, and they behave differently. They have many uh, skills that are automatic and effortless. So in the area of ethics, how are ethical experts different from novices? Those with ethical expertise are more ethically sensitive. That means they see more, they perceive more, they imagine better, and they feel more deeply. They're better at ethical judgment. That means reasoning and reflection on action. They're more ethically focused. That means attentive. Uh, to the needs of others, they're motivated to help others, their personal identity is wrapped up with being an ethical person, and they're better at completing ethical action. They have more effective action um, capacities, and they're more steadfast. <clears throat> so the toolbox of ethical skills we developed uh, based on these four areas <clears throat> and for each domain of study so that a social studies teacher, a science teacher, a language teacher, they could each apply this, the skill activities to, or they slightly change their regular lesson, their regular academic lesson to also build uh, sensitivity or judgment, focus, or action. And this again is part of the Minnesota Community Voices and Character Education Project. And this is the E in RAVES. <clears throat> So ethical sensitivity has to do with noticing and connecting to others. So we developed a set of skills, uh, seven skills for each of these four areas, <clears throat> and then three skills, for sub skills for each of the skills, right? And they include things like how to be civil and courteous, how to show friendship and care, how to work with diversity, how to manage your aggression, or communicating well, how to express emotion, how to speak and listen in different contexts, how to monitor your communication, taking the perspectives of others, <clears throat> how to take a perspective of justice, of mercy, of different cultural perspectives, how to determine what is happening in a situation, how to perceive moral issues, and finally, how to control social bias, to uh, diagnose and overcome personal bias, which we all have, and how to nurture tolerance. The second set of skills <clears throat> involve ethical judgment, thinking or reasoning skills, and practicing <clears throat> includes solving ethical problems, gathering the right kind of information and predicting consequences, critical reasoning, using sound reasoning and monitoring your reasoning, making right choices, Developing codes and shifting codes based on the situation, determining the appropriate codes to apply in a situation, choosing environments and activities that are supportive of ethical development, making good choices. <clears throat> and then we have coping and resiliency here, where you apply positive thinking and develop resiliency through multiple uh, subskills. <clears throat> ethical focus is the third one. That's motivation, where you aim, are you, what are you aiming for? And the skills that we have here include valuing community traditions and institutions, where you need to understand social structures, practice democracy, we are democracy focused, and cooperation, how to cultivate conscience and self-command, self-control, how to be honorable, how to be a good steward, a good citizen, how to respect others and cultivate wisdom and show reverence, <clears throat> how to develop ethical integrity and identity, how to reach your potential, finding purpose and cultivating commitment. <clears throat> and finally, the fourth area is ethical action, 
This is where um, skills include resolving conflicts and problems, how to negotiate, how to make amends, um, how to stand up under pressure, how to take ethical action, thinking strategically, getting help when you need it, responding creatively to obstacles, how to take initiative as a leader, attending to human needs, asserting yourself respectfully, mentoring others, <laughs> working hard by setting reachable goals, managing your time, being steadfast, developing competence, and taking charge of your life. So all these processes are needed for an ethical behavior to take place. You can fail in any one of them in a particular situation, <clears throat> and you, you will not then carry out an ethical behavior. So if you don't notice that someone needs help, you won't help them. Uh, if you make a bad decision about how to help them, uh, then the behavior could go off um, the path. If you're not motivated because you had something else you wanted to do, maybe you know you should be helping, you saw they needed help, but you want to do something else, then you won't be behave. Or maybe all those things happen. You saw it, you thought it was the best thing to do, you want to do it, but then you don't know how to do it, right? And you fail. I'm sorry, this is this is the failing of action, right? So you could fail at any point. Um, you need skills in every area for every kind of situation. The last letter in RAVES is S, and that stands for self-authorship, self-actualization, self-command. Once developed virtues, these capacities, these social skills, these ethical skills, they must be maintained through the selection of appropriate friends, appropriate activities, appropriate environments. So the teacher doesn't want to be needed forever, right? You want the student to be able to select themselves the right things to do. <clears throat> and that's where self-authorship comes in. And the ability to self-actualize, to meet your potential is critical then for the well-being of, of our humanity, of our communities and our, our planet. <clears throat> the perception of personal agency, which is um, part of self-actualization, is formed from our self-regulatory skills and lies at the heart of the sense of self. So this is where we empower the student. Let me just show you a little data from the project. <clears throat> My collaborators, Minnesota Department of Education, Minnesota is a state in the United States. <clears throat> and it was a collaborative model that we built over three years. We had volunteer educator teams at schools from around our state. We, the research team, offered character, the character framework, those four components, ethical sensitivity, judgment, uh, focus, and action. And we office, offered the novice to expert pedagogy. And then each local team designed their unique implementation. So another way to look at it is this. We call this a common morality model where the researchers provide kind of the frameworks. What's the psychology of character, of morality, of ethics? And what's the pedagogy to use? Expertise development, right? And then the bottom-up aspect of the model is the teacher educators decide what should be taught. Well, first, the community needs. What skills do, do our students need? what matches with the community's uh, culture, and how do we then implement those um, skill development? Who's gonna teach which skills in which class? And so then each school has a local unique implementation, which of course makes it difficult to assess and evaluate. <clears throat> but in the final year, our fourth year, we compared student effects at two high implementing schools, where that means that they included skill development in their advisory or homeroom periods, in the uh, curriculum throughout the school, and in school-wide projects. And most, if not all, teachers were involved in um, fostering ethical skill development. <clears throat> and we had two low implementing schools where only one or two types of implementation were um, <clears throat> included, so one or two of these, and half or fewer teachers were involved. And we compared these outcomes with a control school, a comparison school. 
And what we did was we used school climate as a covariate. We wanted to control for school climate to see whether the ethical skills themselves um, increased in the um, target schools. <clears throat> climate uh, measures we used were student connectedness to school, their perception of teacher connectedness to students, the perceptions of teacher attitudes, and perceptions of teacher behavior. Overall, we uh, compared students on gain scores, so post-test minus pre-test scores. Our ethical skill measures were ethical sensitivity, which was uh, using this measure, concern for others. Ethical focus measures were ethical identity, community bonding, citizenship, and the ethical action measure was ethical assertiveness. We did not measure ethical judgment. And this is these are the results. So on the, the left uh, columns is the control school, the comparison school, and their pre and post, uh, their gain scores. The low implementing schools are in the middle here, and the high implementing schools scores are here on the right side. So you can see that the, the uh, low implementing schools became more aware perhaps of, of issues, but, and because of that, this is a common finding in, in uh, interventions that the initial awareness decreases scores on the target measures. <laughs> so we think that's happened, that, that happened here because the implementation was so minimal, but you can see then that the high scoring or the high implementing um, schools did get higher scores especially on concern for others, which was the target of the schools. Um, so the summary is that climate positively influenced the development of ethical focus skills. So we, this is the, the covariate. So the climate of the school, how welcoming the school felt to students uh, was associated with community bonding, the sense of bonding a sense of citizenship and a commitment to ethical goodness. And then high implementation positively influenced the development of ethical focus, <clears throat> community bonding, ethical goodness, and uh, ethical sensitivity. This one, it was particularly uh, focused on um, by two of the high implementing schools, the two high implementing schools. So our, we concluded that deep and broad implementation of ethical skill instruction had positive significant effects on students, whereas minimal implementation had little positive effect and actually uh, made things seemingly worse or <laughs> they got lower scores because they became more aware perhaps uh, of what wasn't happening. Overall, the framework for success that we were testing that we still um, support is that caring relationships which is the context, plus a supportive community process, plus ethical skill development, the content, lead through apprenticeship and self-regulation approaches, the methods, actually result in higher citizenship, higher sense of the common good, better ethical character, and community flourishing, although we didn't test that. Our materials are free online, <clears throat> They're also uh, in books that have with hundreds of ideas for how to implement, integrate these skills into regular instruction. Um, but you can get the free materials here um, with a lot of other uh, supporting documentation. <clears throat> All right, so ecological literacy, well-being, and ethics go together. So early years established well-being and ethical roots. So natural neuroeducation is lifelong. So we're, we're actually training up, forming the neurobiology of our young by how we treat them. And we're also fostering the healthy cooperative neurobiology by the kind of environments we live in. So our community support system and we want to start early on to establish the well being because it matters uh, how you begin, where you're going to end up. So, in early life, we want to grow biophilia through nature immersion, <laughs> building nature attachment and placefulness, 
We want to build traditional ecological knowledge. This is uh, indigenous First Nation knowledge, place-based know-how for living regeneratively. We need to focus on supporting native peoples, indigenous First Nation peoples, because they still have some of this knowledge and they've been <clears throat> living in those places for thousands of years. And we need to honor their wisdom <clears throat> and then build our own. And the indigenous worldview is one of inclusion and one of respect for the natural world that we also need to adopt. Uh, that's the work I've been doing more recently. And we need to construct then social connectedness and keep that going, fostering well-being and self-regulation through the evolved nest, encourage self, uh, self-actualization at individual potential, which the evolved nest does as well. So educators in the schools are role models. <clears throat> They show care and responsibility in all these areas. They are concerned for future generations and they show ecological know-how. So this is the kind of role modeling we need. We want active learning, of course. Sustainable classrooms are going to be then trauma-informed so they know what triggers uh, students into um, feeling afraid or angry and try to help um, them avoid that those triggers, but also then a pro, a, um, provide wellness promotion, which would be through the healing practices that then decrease the triggering of the trauma experiences. We want to then foster responsible environmental relations <clears throat> throughout all education at every age level, nurturing relations to the self, because the self is part of nature, to others, so we know how to get along with others, uh, diverse others, and to other than humans. So with the rest of the natural world, we want to nurture respectful, responsible relations all throughout. And through stories and observation, we want to build capacities and wisdom and responsibilities for getting along well. We want to encourage holistic self-mastery. So to use healing practices when appropriate and encourage students to learn the ones that work best for them, to offer self-actualization opportunities. Every student has a unique gift to offer the world. We don't want to treat them all the same, um, <clears throat> expect them to be um, cutouts of the same capacities, but follow their, their passions, their uh, ability to fit into the community with their calling. So the calling is a sense of passion and interest that connects with what's needed in the community. And we wanna build always social and emotional intelligence throughout life. We all need to keep increasing that in our diverse world. And again, that sustaining healing classroom that is gonna promote the self-calming techniques, <clears throat> social pleasure uh, capacities, the silly humor and play and dance and art and the communal imagination, that sense of group attachment. It's all us and us, not us against them and ecological attachment. We are in this together. Apprenticeship and responsibility for living well on the earth is what we need to help students gain with uh, experience guided by wise mentors in order to foster the ethical judgment and eth ethical motivation that has the earth in mind. So we always keep the earth in our um, set of concerns for being an ethical person. And our sensitivity is inclusive. Then. Our ethical sensitivity is uh, we understand the effects of our actions on others, human and other non-humans uh, that we can affect by the way we act. Finally, let me just say that <clears throat> all this will lead us to primal wisdom. Primal wisdom is a um, what I call indigenous wisdom, and we also call it kinship uh, worldview. This uh, traditional wisdom here is the Christian traditions, but I think the Eastern philosophies are parallel in some ways. So the shared properties between indigenous or primal wisdom and traditional Christian wisdom are these in the top. 
that wisdom exists beyond intellect. That's why we need to not just focus on intellect, but a holistic way of being. Our heart, spirit, body, as well as mind, need to be uh, cultivated. <clears throat> Wisdom accesses other realms. So this is other than they manifest what you can see and measure. Humans have special responsibilities to co-create the world. We are the ones who have more choices. We have more <clears throat> responsibilities as a result. To practice wisdom involves surrendering to the energy realm. It means understanding that there is more than just the energy I have in my body uh, but there's other energies out there that we have to <clears throat> be uh, listened to. And David Bohm, the physicist, says that our creativity comes from outside. Insight intelligence is actually coming from the energy realm, which he calls the implicate order. Practice of wisdom involves ego detachment. So it's non-egoistic. <clears throat> it's state dependent. That means we have to be in a state of love and not fear. We have to be present, completely present. And we, we get into the cosmic connection mode. Of we feel oneness and in love with the universe. And we don't let fear overtake us, which takes us out of wisdom. Then we have the things that differ between the two kinds of wisdom. And there's two that are critical. One is <clears throat> primal wisdom or indigenous wisdom is you feel compassion towards all of the natural world. In the Christian tradition, it's just for people. It's anthropocentric. That's part of the reason we're destroying, destroying our planet because our system for the dominant culture has really focused on people and not the rest of the natural world. And then what is feared in the primal or indigenous wisdom is alienation from our animal nature. Our animal nature is very intelligent. We evolved for millions of years and we evolved from billions of years of the planet. Um, but in the Western wisdom tradition, there's a fear of the animal nature. Now, I think this comes in part because of the undercare of babies and the, how babies get very dysregulated when you don't give them, provide the nest. And they look like they're very selfish and immature and, you know, and all that stuff. And so you have all these dysregulated people who are very self-centered because they were undercared for. So there's a vicious cycle there. So in both cases, uh, gift sharing is important where it's not optional for among the indigenous, whereas it's a choice over here. So I think uh, we have to get back over here. And that's what some of my books uh, focus on. Back to this cycle of cooperative companionship where we have uh, companionship, childhood, uh, pro uh, promoting a good physio, psychosocial, neurobiology with adult well-being wisdom as the result and a community that attends to basic needs. And these needs are not only human, <clears throat> but those of the earth and our planetary home. So education for primal wisdom is going to have be holistic development of body, mind, and spirit. <clears throat> It'll focus on ecological fittedness, fitting into the landscape, not controlling it, eradicating it, destroying it, right? No, fittedness, moving with nature. <clears throat> and then our ethical capacities are going to be inclusive of all earth entities. We are in this together. Uh, it's not just about humans. It's about all of us. There are many books. <clears throat> the most recent one is Restoring the Kinship Worldview. Uh, and this uh, is a dialogue book about indigenous voices rebalancing life on planet Earth. The book that's coming out this summer, uh, in, well, in 2023, is The Evolved Nest, Nature's Way of Raising Children and Creating Connected Communities. And the one where a lot of the neurobiological information is, is housed is this one, neurobiology and the development of human morality, evolution, culture, and wisdom. <clears throat> I want to thank the Family Life Project, Mary Tarsha, the Evolutionary Developmental Moral Psychology Lab, the University of Notre Dame. <clears throat> Here's more information about how to contact me. Uh, there's many papers to download at the academic webpage. 
We have a six minute movie, breakingthecyclefilm.org, uh, which is in multiple, has captions in multiple languages. Uh, more information about the Evolved Nest and lots of tools for people. Kindred Media also has a lot of information for re, uh, redirecting human development. And the curriculum materials, again, that I mentioned are here. Thank you very much for your attention.